I wanted to highlight uh, today some work that I've done over the last couple of decades in this area and really to highlight the areas that some of the viral experts have really been able to bring to the table to help us as molecular epidemiologists really try to take the uh, information forward in the field to try to work on a real on, on, you know, on what happens in the field. So uh, polio, um, despite what we don't see here in the US and the Western world, actually is an is a ancient disease. It's been seen since uh, 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 two to three millennia ago, at least, and actually was the principal cause of disability in the world in the pre-vaccine era. And in order to understand what the epidemiology of, of most diseases are, obviously we need to understand how these viruses work. And um, essentially, uh, the polio virus is a hep it's a enterovirus C, um, uh, and it's one of the picornaviruses. It comes in three distinct serotypes, one, two, and three. They, there is not cross-protection among the three. They infect only humans to produce disease. There can be experimental infection in uh, primates, but those don't result in nat natural disease. And primarily is transmitted by fecal or the fecal oral route. Um, the vaccines and prior infection, this is critical, do not provide sterilizing immunity. And this is, becomes important in terms of what we're gonna talk about later, which is in, uh, uh, recurrent infections can lead to shedding and additional transmission of disease. Um, and so um, uh, a, a virus, which then could potentially infect uh, non-immune subjects and, and persist and create persistent circulation in communities. The va vaccines generally shed virus in stool for about one to four weeks. The virus is highly contagious and uh, rapidly mutates. And this is a slide just showing very briefly uh, the polio genome, which is small, about 7,700 uh, base pairs more or less, with the, uh, the five prime coding, non-coding region highlighted here, because this is thought to be a major area for virulence, um, and particularly here, this region five, which contains some canonical point mutations that when uh, the vaccines were, the live vaccines were produced, actually resulted in attenuations at three sites, one for each of the serotypes, Primarily, there are other uh, mutations, but these are the major ones thought to uh, result in uh, attenuating mutations at the iris binding site, uh, which can lead to um, reduced virulence and uh, um, also paradoxically can actually, re uh, re um, the attenuations can uh, be overcome so that in live uh, vaccines, you can actually see the pre presence of vaccine-associated paralytic polio. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So we, most of you know that there are two major vaccines. There are others that are being produced today by manufacturers and, and by foundations to try to overcome some of the barriers that we're seeing today with um, eradication. But the first vaccine is the Salk inactivated polio vaccine, which is a purified uh, formal and inactivated uh, viral um, product and is used in most developed countries. It's more expensive than the live vaccine, uh, but it does not produce primarily gut and immunity, and I don't have time to go into that, but essentially that is a question that we are really don't understand. It appears not to produce humoral gut immunity. We and others are doing studies to try to identify that, and it appears that there may be some degree of gut immunity, and that's a, a big question we may have time for at the end. Secondly is the uh, Sabin oral polio vaccine, and this is an attenuated live virus. I talked a little bit about that before. It's very inexpensive. It's pennies for the dose. You can give it orally, so you don't need to worry about administration issues. Um, used primarily in the developing world and actually produ produ produces immunity is very similar to nat natural infection. And also herd immunity because you shed virus and you, you can then, you know, by secondary intent, you can spread uh, immunity to those non-vaccinated individuals in your community. Now, in the 80s, it became very clear that poliovirus infection really occurred to a large extent in developing, set in developing settings of the world, but was really under-recognized because um, it really doesn't kill most people. It actually provides uh, lifelong disability. And so in the developing world, it wasn't really appreciated until people went out and literally did lameness surveys and found that it was indeed a very important problem. And I won't talk about epidemiologically 
why that wasn't also discovered. Um, but um, suffice it to say that the World Health Assembly in the 80s uh, voted to eradicate polio because number one, uh, there's only really a human reservoir of disease. Number two, there's an effective vaccine. And number three, there's a way to detect the virus. So those are the three general ways that you can define an eradicable disease. Um, and so at that time, you can see the map here, about 350,000 cases in mean, 125 endemic countries. Today, 74 cases in 2015, um, with only two indigenous uh, endemic areas now, Nigeria has been polio free. So um, what are the risks? Now the risks are that the vaccines, the live vaccine will now threaten the eradication of polio because these vaccines can do two things. One is you can see vaccine associated paralytic polio as I talked about before, as well as vaccine derived polio viruses, which are just polio viruses that will continue to circulate in the absence of full immunization. And for other uh, reasons, for example, again, the lack of sterilizing immunity and um, um, we can see vaccine, and we don't really know the extent to which circulation of vaccine viruses will occur. And for this reason, we really need to stop OPV use followed by a, a prolonged period of killed vaccine use so that we can essentially get rid of live circulating vaccine as well as wild type viruses. So cessation of live vaccine has become a very big issue at the global level. And it's part of the polio end game. This is 2013, here's where we are now. We just stopped using polio virus type, vaccine polio virus type two in all live vaccine viruses because it has been eliminated. Uh, the wild type has been eliminated and we hope to eliminate the vaccine virus as well. And hopefully at some time in the next few years, we'll be able to say that we've eliminated eliminated type one and type three. We haven't seen a case of type one in several years and we haven't seen a case of type three, wild type three or one since 2012. So what have we done? Uh, really, we're looking, the real issues now are post-eradication um, and what are we gonna do? We need to look at OPV circulating strains and we have to look at these as defined by a percentage of genetic deviation from parent strains. Um, and also de determine whether this is community circulation or also immunodeficient circulation. Um, essentially, immune, certain immune deficiencies, particularly those that affect B cell uh, function, can actually create persistent uh, enterovirus, including poliovirus infections in individuals. While these are small numbers of people, they could potentially serve as point sources for ongoing dissemination of viruses. There have been case reports of individuals who have shed polioviruses for 20 plus years because of this B cell defect. Um, and so we need to understand, in particular, OPV and VDPV transmission and parameters in the long run of intestinal immunity, which um, uh, especially around the IPV. So if we use the killed vaccine, how well that will that really protect our guts from these circulating viruses? So um, what we're looking at in my lab is really to try to look at patterns of OPD transmission using different vaccine regimens and different types of population to understand uh, what is the risk. Um, and so we'll start with Zimbabwe, where I've been working now for over 15 years. Um, and we have a, a site here about 20 kilometers outside of the capital where they have national immunization campaigns with some supplementary OPV uh, vaccination pro uh, programs. The last wild type case was uh, in 1999. And what we did is we uh, did a number of studies. The first was a small cross-sectional study just to understand OPV immunity in pediatric HIV infected patients. The idea being that HIV infection in children actually induces a B cell dysfunction. So do these B cell dysfunctions uh, are they equivalent to congenital B cell immunodeficiencies? And so we sought to look at that issue because we thought these could be potentially sources of transmission. Um, and in this particular study, we basically just look at um, antibody production after doses of OPV, depending on HIV status. And what you can see here in the dark is HIV uh, uninfected children, and here HIV infected. And indeed, this is number of doses. And you see that at all levels of doses, HIV infected children um, are less likely to seroconvert to the, vac the live vaccine virus. Um, and in, in addition, the children who do seroconvert have many, much lower geometric mean titers. So we do know that these children don't respond well to this antigen, and these were children who were not treated with um, our ARTs. This was before the ART era. 
Um, and so then the second study looking at OPV shedding in this population, and what we looked at was what happens to the gut response to the vaccine. So let's just say you get an OPV dose. Are these children going to shed? And what you can see here again with the HIV infected children in the dark bars, they are much more likely to continue shedding virus than their HIV negative uh, colleagues who um, will over time develop presumably gut immunity and not shed virus. Uh, which is concerning, and in particular here what we see is that serotype 1 and serotype 2 are significantly more likely to be shed um, among those children. Um, serotype 3 doesn't uh, generally shed, is not shed in as, as large quantities in general, but uh, we did see that. Now fortunately in this table what you see here is uh, shedding over time in these children among HIV infected and uninfected children. And what you see is that, again, here's that increase in shedding of the HIV infected kids um, in at less than 43 days from their third dose of OPV. Um, but over time, they, they do develop some kind of immune response. So fortunately, although these children are more likely to shed at given points, they don't persist. So the, the bad news is that we, they do have uh, altered immune responses, but they will shed, that they won't shed long term and presumably are not persistent sources of infection around the world, or at least in this population. And then we looked at another study where we took the same children and tried to look at nutritional status. And the bottom line is we did not find a correlation with severe malnutrition. You have to realize in this population, the normal child was already malnourished, but we had to take two standard deviations away from the mean of malnutrition to look, and those children, even as stunted and malnourished as they were, did not, were not more likely to shed uh, virus. Um, so that was also somewhat reassuring. Um, and then we looked at household transmission. So are these children and their HIV-infected mothers more likely to shed long-term? And this was a smaller study of, of 301 mothers with 536 stool samples that were taken right after two of the OPV doses to the children. And the point here is that among these mothers, very few, I think it was uh, for about 16 mothers, shed um, vaccine virus, um, and only no mother shed more than once. So we think that, at least in, in, in HIV-infected populations, again, persistence among household contacts will not be an issue. So now what we're doing is a study in Mexico looking at IPV, because again, the issue is, can IPV really protect us when we get rid of live vaccination against live vaccine virus? And so um, IPV provides protection but limit against disease but probably not mucosally. There is a large, uh, a growing body of literature that suggests that IPV can boost intestinal immunity if you've had OP, uh, live vaccine or live infection uh, through the gut. So, but the question is, uh, given no uh, previous experience with live virus, can the killed virus provide that same immunity? And we're trying to understand that now. And so we're working in Mexico now, where I've worked more for like over 25 years now, in indigenous populations. And in this population, we're working in Veracruz State, in a population of indigenous communities um, in the inland area. Um, and what, this, is a, this is a first study which we're, where we actually just tried to see if we can find virus in environmental samples as well as in individual children um, over a period of three national vaccine campaigns. Mexico is important to study because um, they have been using killed vaccine uh, only as a routine immunization since 2007. So all young children are only getting killed vaccines since 2007. And, seven, um, and the campaigns are, but they still give for some reason that we are we don't really understand. The Mexican government still gives two doses of live vaccine, uh, or one dose twice a year to all children under five. So there's an opportunity to use that OPV, that live vaccine, as a challenge to see whether what happens to children when they experience that live virus challenge. It's also an opportunity to look at age-related cohorts because um, the mothers and the um, other family members have received live vaccine, and you can compare the shedding and transmission in those populations. Populations. And so the first thing that we did was look at sewage samples collected 
for one month periods over uh, a one year period uh, encompassing three vaccine, live vaccine administrations. And the idea was that we could, could we detect live vaccine our RNA, or, or at least our viral RNA in sewage samples from these communities? And I'm sorry for this slide, it's a very busy slide, but um, these are the villages that we looked in, and this is serotype one, serotype two, serotype three, and this is months after the vaccine campaign. And remember, we were looking for persistence, so we didn't really look very early. But what you can see here is this is, uh, these are the, this is our CT numbers here, and I, um, um, and we can see that all of these samples here for type one are virtually all negative, and almost all of the type threes are negative, but you see a, a, a type two virus circulating in the sewage for as long as up to seven months. And this actually is positive here, but that's because there was another campaign that started right here. So we think that there could be persistence up to seven months, although the virus that was identified at seven months was uh, actually very atypical. That is, we also put in a SNP that codes for, that we can detect uh, uh, re revertent mutation, so looking for the VAP marker that I mentioned earlier. And uh, that virus that showed up there looked very new, like right out of the bottle. So that was not possible, given that the virus was given back here. So we think that was an introduction from Central America or somewhere else. And we didn't have enough RNA to, be, to sequence that to, to verify. But so we know that at least through five months, there might be virus uh, in sewage, and so, but the good news is that it really didn't last much longer than that. So we think that this live virus, given this high level of immunization in the community, could cease normal circulation of the vaccine virus. What we then did is we took the stool samples from 72 children who we followed through that period of time, and we tried to look and see what, what happens with circulation. So obviously, children who were enrolled and received vaccine in the blue here were much more likely to shed because they were getting live vaccine and you wanted them to shed, essentially. And so, but you see that they dropped off fairly rapidly. This is the total here. But these are the household contacts and you do see a low level of, of shedding that seems to cease like around five months or so. And this coincided very nicely with the sewage samples that we saw. And by the way, those were both blinded studies, so we didn't know uh, we didn't correlate those until afterwards. And it turns out that we think that about five months at the very latest when you might see some viral uh, shedding. And then when you looked at it, uh, this by serotype, we found that um, uh, this is any positive here that you see that um, serotype two was much more likely to be shed. And that was actually true uh, for the individuals who were community acquired, or that is non-vaccinated. So this is serotype two. So the kids who got vaccinated shed every virus equally. Um, and serotype two seems to be a little more robust. We did further studies after this, and what we found is that the, the primers that we were using were in the, um, in the uh, five prime region. When, and when we went back and did the deep sequencing, which I won't have temps chance to talk about today, we found that some of those viruses were actually enteroviruses and there was a concurrent uh, enterovirus uh, uh, season uh, interfering there, but it still did not affect the statistical uh, differences in the other studies that we showed. So we um, actually think that some of this type 2 might be enterovirus um, that actually cross-reacts really well with serotype 2, um, but, some of, but, but most of this was still polio. Um, so the other thing we learned from this is we changed our primers. So we went off and did made primers for VP1, which was a lot more sensitive and specific. And in that, in those studies, which again I can't show you today, we found uh, that there were no that the sensitivity um, uh, was uh, was pretty good, but the specificity was really high. Uh, probably like 95% at this point. And so we also tried to look at, um, I'll skip that for a second. So what we're doing now is we're working with the Gates Foundation and we're trying to understand in much more detail what happens with household transmission of this vaccine virus. Uh, again, trying to understand what's gonna happen post eradication. And we're also collecting sewage samples at the same time so that we can see what happens in the community. And at this point we're just in the, uh, we just collected all our clinical samples and we just uh, finished about half, uh, analyzing half of our samples. So again, in Mexico, we know the story there, and I talked about the age-related immunization coverage, so we can look at different age-related groups to see whether their shedding correlates with, um, 
um, their immunization status correlates with shedding. So this is an observational uh, community randomized trial in three indigenous villages in which we gave either 10, 30, or 70 percent of the kids in the population the oral polio vaccine during the national campaign. As I mentioned before, everybody in the village, in the communities in the entire country is supposed to get a dose of, op of, killed, of live vaccine if they're under five, but we were able to do in these three communities a very focused uh, study. Um, and this, the setting is here again in the same community, three dis geographically distinct but very uh, co-local um, communities, uh, but really uh, with, with very deep valleys in between. So they were very nearby, they were very similar, but they didn't travel amongst each other very well, very much. Um, and this is the study design. We actually went, did a census of all three villages. Um, I think it was over uh, uh, 3,000 people. And then we identified within each of the villages um, uh, uh, 400 and about 450 households, 150 households in each community. And then those, in, uh, those 150 households had to have at least one vaccine eligible child that is somebody under five years of age. And what we did was we only vaccinated, or we randomized the households to either getting a vaccine uh, or not getting vaccines. So in the 10% cohort, 15 houses out of 135 were vaccinated and the other, uh, the other 135 were not. And the whole community was also not vaccinated. So this was really a, uh, just a very, a very few number of people with vaccination so that we could really study the transmission of the vaccine virus. Um, the other issue here is that um, uh, yeah, so, so um, yeah, so this was, and this was only the first dose of vaccine a year ago in February. Uh, we also then collected stool samples uh, on day, on baseline day one, four, seven, et cetera, from all 450 um, households, every member of the household over that period of time. Uh, uh, and polio immunization data, as well as other social and demographic information. From these 16,000 stool samples, uh, we actually developed four aliquots because we had issues with freezing and thawing. So we've had a huge, several freezers full of samples that were, uh, half of which were sent to Stanford for processing. And here's the, what we found so far. Um, this, so what we've only been able to do at this point is we've processed about half of our stool samples, 176 individuals, so in about 10% of people shed vaccine virus. 45% uh, of these were people who had not been vaccinated, so this represented transmission. Um, and this, uh, about 4.5% about, uh, of the total stool samples are positive. And this is only data for the 10% village as well as the 70% village because we wanted to look at the outliers. We're going to do the 30% village later. And we only have gotten data through day 14. Um, so what you can see here is that there, these, the dotted lines are children under 5. And the red is the 70% vaccinated village and the blue is the... Um, 10% vaccinated village. So you can see that there are differences. Obviously, the children are going to shed more because they're, um, they're receiving vaccine. But what's interesting, when you look at the total population, if you pull out just the adult, everyone over five, um, you're still seeing a significant difference in shedding in the 70 versus the 10%. And we think that's obvious. I think it makes sense that, that people who get more virus exposure are gonna shed. I think the question here from the practical standpoint, from the public health standpoint, is to try to understand um, what is the threshold? Is 10%, let's just say 10% of people have virus circulating in their community because they were under vaccinated or for other reasons. Um, is that enough to have persistence and transmission of vaccine virus? And so, um, so that's where we are at this point. Um, so in summary, we have pop, uh, so we've seen that populations was diminished uh, severely diminished B cell activities do not demonstrate persistent shedding, but they do have um, immune defects that result in decreased seroconversion. The malnutrition, at least in this study, does not appear to play a role in shedding. Um, but as I mentioned, um, we did have um, uh, decreased uh, immune responses, which could affect perhaps um, a, a potential uh, confluence that could lead to an outbreak or two. 
healthy children in uh, routine IPV only settings, uh, for example in Mexico, shed OPV for up to seven months and more likely really only up to five months. In this population, um, this community circulation could be demonstrated by environmental sampling. Um, uh, uh, many of the governments around the world are now trying to do environmental sampling to try to understand what, uh, what they can detect and what that, but we don't really know what that means. For example, if you see a positive, you know there's virus, somebody in the community, but what does having a negative sewage sample mean? And we're gonna try to determine that from analysis of our sewage samples as well to see, because people would like to have some way to detect presence of a virus. Um, and then finally, uh, we found, um, in a, other studies that I couldn't show you that when we did deep sequencing, uh, uh, a whole genome sequencing that uh, we did not notice over that longer period, that one year period of time, we did not see any uh, vaccine uh, derived poliovirus precursors or high viral variants and that paper is um, actually in process now. And then finally, the degree and persistence of OPV transmission at this point is likely related to the threshold of number of susceptible and infected individuals in the population. And we will be modeling that data more uh, further in order to understand where some of, those, some of those thresholds might be and how well we can detect virus in sewage um, and predict whether or not uh, circulating virus is present and uh, needs to be uh, addressed by, say, uh, additional uh, campaigns, either with uh, fortified in, uh, inactivated vaccine viruses that are being developed or by other mechanisms. And so I'll stop there. And uh, I just, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to just uh, thank all of my colleagues at Stanford, um, at Eastern Virginia Medical College, uh, who were colleagues who worked with me in my lab and then moved on there. Uh, my Mexican colleagues at the Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública in Zimbabwe at the University of ha uh, Harare, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation colleagues, and well, as well as our funding sources. Thank you very much. Time for questions over there? Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to ask a very naive question. Uh, how can you comment on the amount of time and the cost of sequencing hundreds of patient samples in this way? Was it genomic sequencing? Oh no, no, no. This is. I'm sorry. I didn't. I, I didn't have time to go. I have all of those slides after this. But we just developed a, a, a VP1. So we did a, um, a VP1 uh, prime. Uh, developed VP1 primers to look for. Uh, the virus, and actually using these primers, you can actually detect um, the uh, the sequences that are uh, um, that are uh, serotype specific. And so we did do another study that was uh, full whole genome sequencing for a specific project, but that's nothing that you would even think about doing for real public health surveillance. So good question. Question over uh, there. Me? Okay. Uh, yeah, the uh, number of strains of uh, OPV are certainly declined. Uh, and I, I guess it's, uh, so not all three strains are now of OPV are there, but not in the wild type there aren't. Uh, the uh, use, uh, there are wild type, one and uh, two is gone. And uh, so now they are using monovalent uh, oral polio vaccine. And I was wondering, uh, with the uh, monovalent oral polio vaccine, how the shedding of the uh, changes might change. Perfect question. So in fact, uh, some places are doing monovalent. There have been studies with mono. There's, but mostly what the world is using right now, as of April of this year, um, is a switch to the bivalent, so one in three. And um, we plan to study, so in Mexico, again, which is our natural um, experiment, right? So we, because we know that they don't use it any other time of the year. They actually haven't switched over to bivalent yet, so they're gonna do it in October. What we're gonna do is try to look at that, because in fact, as most of you who vi culture these viruses know, there's a lot of competition among these three serotypes, and what, what's serotype two gone, uh, we would wonder whether there might be more persistence of one and three that was just uninhibited now because two isn't present. We certainly found that in very early studies among Mayan populations. <laughs> Um, when we were first looking at immunogenicity. Um, I, I doubt that that's going to happen, but it's, it's worthwhile to look for. So we were going to be looking for that in stool samples as well as sewage. That's a great question. Question there? Yes, you. Oh. Uh, so 
everyone who is vaccinated with OPV2 you know, prior to this year, you're going to have a small population uh, of them who are immunocompromised and long-term shedders. And now you start with IPV2. And, and this new population doesn't have very good gut immunity. And so you're going to continue to, to spread at least some virus, or you have the potential to do that. And the concept is that we'd ultimately like to get rid of vaccinating in general. When do you think it'll be safe to do that? And what measures do you use in order to figure that out? Yeah, well, I think, and I'm looking at Raul because I'm sure he has some opinions too. Everyone has an opinion. Um, I won't say what people think about opinions, but uh, basically um, we don't know the answer to that. And there's a lot of modeling going on. This is actually one of the reasons why this study was done. We need to understand when you can dampen out that. So some people think force of infection is important, that is viral load, et cetera. We're trying to look at viral load so far. We haven't found that impact, but we don't have an analyzed enough samples. Secondly, it appears that there's not a lot of transmission. You can see 7%, even at this point, is fairly low, and most of the literature supports that. There's very little literature in this area, and it's in the pre- it was in the viral tissue cultural era, so we don't know. But that's exactly the fear. The fear is that there's going to be small groups, and then paradoxically, if you have to come back and give oral polio again, you may start circulation. So um, we're hoping that IPV will be better than that. We have some fecal immunity markers that we're trying to look at with, to see if we can correlate. I, I'm, one of my fellows is working on a fecal um, ELISA for um, actually serotype specific IgA that seems to be working that we could maybe track and see if it correlates with shedding or not shedding. So there, there's a lot of efforts in this area. Um, but we, but you're right. We don't, we don't know that that, and that's the big fear that we would consist that. And so the, the, then to answer your specific question, some people uh, who shall be remain, remain unnamed at the government level would say, I'm never going to stop using IPV. But I think at a certain point there will be a period where we can see, we hope that we can see a cessation of all vaccine use. Um, yeah, and that's again why environmental surveillance might be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I have a sort of related question. There are other enteroviruses, non-polio type, that can cause polio type paralysis. Yeah. And do you worry about them filling the niche if you stop using your OPV? I mean, is that a valid concern? Uh, so certainly we know that NRO71 had, there was a huge outbreak in China some years ago, and that caused lots of disease, and people were concerned, and that seems to have dampened out. Um, in fact, most people think there, there's some day evidence to suggest that polios themselves came from Coxsackie viruses. As you know, these viruses mutate quite a bit, and we see probably some uh, biodiversity because of that. Um, it, uh, it's really not clear that, and then last, a few years ago with NRO68, people were very concerned. So yeah, we, we don't know, again, we're not, we, we can say the same thing for pneumococcus or any other disease for which we develop a vaccine and for which there are similar uh, biovars, you know, what's gonna happen, we don't know. Uh, we would expect, these viruses are actually not highly virulent in humans, and we really think that the, the central nervous system effects are almost an accidental a, a secondary um, effect because it's really it doesn't happen in very many of the patients. But but you're right that may be that may be a concern and people are we're already doing again that's the other reason to do environmental surveillance. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>